Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kentucky Small Business Development Center's weekly webinar. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dave Etkin. I'm the director here in the Louisville Center in Louisville, Kentucky. As you come in and get settled, I'd like to take a few moments to share some information about the Kentucky SBDC program. The Kentucky Small Business Development Center program is a statewide program providing the professional expertise, tools, and information necessary for entrepreneurs to start, fund, and grow their businesses. We do this at no cost, thanks to the U.S. Small Business Administration, the University of Kentucky, as well as regional universities, colleges, and local economic development agencies. To learn more, visit us at KentuckySPDC.com, and there you'll find additional resources I know you'll find helpful. If you'd like to request personal assistance from us, please give us uh, shoot us an email at info at KentuckySPDC.com, or just give us a quick call at 1-888-414-414. 7232. If you look to the right of your screen, you'll find the chat feature. And if you have any questions or comments for our presenters, we go through the session today, post them there, and we'll answer them towards the end. And as always, just to test, everything's working fine. You can hear me loud and clear. Do me a favor and say hello. Let me know where you're, uh, where you're watching from. We always like to hear, hear from you guys and see where you are. And uh, Robin's already in there in Paint Lick, Kentucky, and Radcliffe, TW, and Radcliffe. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us today. So again, I'm Dave Edkin. I'm the director here at the Louisville Center. Uh, the Louisville Center is one of 17 centers spread out across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And as a reminder, um, you'll receive a recording of today's, uh, today's webinar so you can watch it over and over again. Um, so today we have a great, uh, a great topic again. Uh, and Zach uh, Zimmerman's come back to see us. And um, you know, the mid-year here in July, it's such a great time to um, really kind of think through about the, you know, what you can do to build your business value. And uh, Zach Zimmerman is a senior valuation analyst with the National Business Valuations, where he conducts business valuations and feasibility studies for SBA borrowers. And prior to that, he was a management consultant for the Nebraska Business Development Center, which is kind of a sister organization of the SBDC program. Zach, good to see you today. Thanks for coming back. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. You know, we were just talking about the importance of knowing the value of your business and um, knowing, uh, you know, what whether the decisions you make and the things that you're doing on a regular basis um, creates value in your business, um, and that these are the right decisions to to increase that value. And one way to do that is to understand what it takes to increase value and and make uh, make have successful valuations. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, valuation is a great time, and especially in the mid year, but kind of reanalyze kind of where you're at in, um, in the mid-year and go from there. Yeah. Well, let's just jump right in here, Zach, and, uh, and get going and talk about valuations and, and the things that we need to know to drive value in our business. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I think Dave was mentioning it a little bit. Um, uh, obviously, this is the second time I worked with Dave here. Uh, a couple months ago, we talked about business valuations. It was more of a kind of a general overview of things to think about. Today, we're going to go a little bit more in depth um, on kind of maybe just three things to know um, uh, about business valuation, how it works, what is it, um, basic terminology, um, nothing too, too drastic, but it kind of gets into a little bit more of the grass. Um, again, I'm Zach Zimmerman. I'm a senior valuation analyst with National Business Valuation. And the majority of our business, we work with kind of SBA lenders, um, usually involved in some sort of transaction um, of an acquisition of a business. Um, usually if a borrow or excuse me, if a buyer approaches a seller trying to buy a business, if they need financing for it, um, one of the options may be approaching a lender, the lender, depending on the situation, um, of the businesses involved, they may use an SBA loan, um, to guarantee a portion of that business or excuse me, of that loan, um, for the lender. Um, for them to do that, they need a third party valuation service. That's kind of where we come in um, and we value that business um, for that transaction to happen. So a little bit different scenario. You can value business for whatever kind of purpose. It doesn't have to be an acquisition, um, but that's kind of um, kind of our specialty where we kind of step in. We work with lenders directly. Um, one of the SBA requirements is the lender has to be the client. They have to facilitate the business valuation on our part um, between the buyer and the seller which the buyer is usually the borrower. So real quick rundown. SBA kind of considers certain qualified sources, um, and obviously that's national business valuation. Um, 
Today we're going to talk about, and this is kind of the title, three things to know about business valuation. Obviously, I'm not 100% aware of um, whoever's on the call, where you're at in your business. You might be a business owner, you might be involved in a business, maybe a partnership, um, maybe a, a percentage of an ownership of a business. Most likely you're small, small business. Maybe you have less than 50 employees. Most likely you have less than maybe $10 million top line revenue. Um, again, do you have value? Um, in your business, there is business value there. Um, do you know it? Um, what, what, what's involved in it? How, 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 what things should I consider if I'm a decision maker in that business? That's kind of what we're going to get into today. Again, we work with buyers and sellers. Um, and obviously there's trends as far as where most buyers and sellers, mainly on the buyer side, what most buyers look at when valuing a business. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to get into today. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of a Q&A session at the end also. Um, so and, and Dave, I think, is monitoring the, the kind of the chat feature. So if you have questions, obviously, it's getting monitored. Um, we can um, definitely answer them at the end um, and then go from there. Shouldn't be too, too bad as far as terminology. Um, again, it's usually basic information. Um, but again, we're not going to get too much into the grass. Just a little bit more things to be aware of going forward here in the mid-year with, you, with your small business. And obviously my contact information is in there. If there's something that comes up off the grid that's a little bit more detailed, you're always welcome to kind of reach out to me or reach out to Dave and we can, can have a conference call any way you wanna handle it. So three things to know about business valuation. Here are the kind of the top three things, kind of the basic kind of pillars, at least in our view, um, what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. Obviously, you always have the earnings game, and we'll talk a little bit about that further. What, what the earnings game, profitability, you know, making money. I mean, everything's based on essentially on the pillar of a business of making money. Now, I know that's kind of basic, but we're going to talk about a little bit of that, of, you know, things as a business owner, maybe that you can do, maybe that you can control with your business um, going forward. Risk mitigation. Um, again, again, what does that mitigation word mean? Again, we're, what's involved in a business. Obviously you guys all know when you're an entrepreneur, when you're a business owner, there's, there's risk involved. You're a risk taker. You're, you're a person that has ideas. I mean, now you're into the business, you've had it worked, you kind of tweaked it, um, but there's still risk involved. We see that with COVID. Um, we see that with, you know, natural disasters all the time. And that's probably more external type of things, but there are some internal things that you might kind of view your business maybe as risky, maybe not. Um, but again, Mitigating those risk factors, um, something definitely to consider. And then market tendencies. We'll talk about that a little bit further, but you know, there's some things that you can't control, honestly. I mean, the outside market um, buyers, the majority of buyers and sellers, they look at um, things differently sometimes and they try to become a negotiation. But markets that kind of, they flow, they flow on themselves. And obviously they're not always kind of, um, they're using information um, that maybe is going in a certain direction. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. And that's kind of, you know, when you kind of, those three things are kind of maybe uh, the pillars of kind of business valuation. Um, and if you consider them, maybe you adjust going into the future. The earnings gain, like I talked about before, I mean, that's probably the most controllable thing I would think you can do as a business owner. I know it's basic. I know this is business 101 when you're saying, look, yeah, I mean, you know, you earn money. Okay, I definitely you earn money going into the future, but you know, do I make money as, as far as on my top line revenue? You know, it, it, you, do I make money after my expenses? I mean, what is it that we're looking for that I can control to increase the value of a business? And this is probably the most kind of controllable thing you do have. You know, you as a business owner, you're the decision maker, you're the pace setter, you're the one that kind of creates the culture, you're the one that kind of shows if you have employees, how to conduct themselves, what's the recipe for success, what recipe are you using um, to conduct yourself in, in your business. And then the, the biggest thing would be is, okay, yes, you, you always have this kind of thing, especially with smaller businesses, um, depending on where you're at, you always have this thing of, um, maybe, may, am I supposed to limit my tax liability? Am I supposed to limit my tax obligation? There's always that. So again, profit is going to be, the earnings is, are going to be the most influential thing you have on your business. Do you grow your market? 
Do you cut down your expenses? Do you grow your market and cut down your expenses? Well, how do I cut down my expenses? Again, I don't want to get taxed on too many things. That's what my CPA is telling me. That's what my business advisors are telling me. And that's one of the perks I have in a small businesses. But when you talk about business valuation, you're essentially talking about, you're talking about most buyers are going to assume that the business makes money. Now, how much money really depends on the type of business. Um, so again, I always kind of use that as kind of a scenario, but you know, what about my assets? What are my tangible things in business? Again, those are considerations, my real estate, my equipment, my furniture and fixtures, my laptops, anything that I have, my inventory, anything that has, you know, significant value. But really it comes down to, you know, yeah, yes, I have all those things, but my profit is my sanity, right? I mean, that's, that's why I'm doing this. The earnings are my sanity. And then obviously, do I have enough cash to make the investments and do I have available cash? Do I have enough cash in the bank? That's why I always you come and I love the word terminology, you know, cash is king. We've always heard that um, as a bit, you know, in your business, you know, cash is king. You know, profit probably is more of the sanity type. Why am I doing this? We're here to make money. That's a basic assumption. We're not here to limit my tax obligation. We're not here to take losses. I mean, some businesses out there, yes, I start this business to take a loss, to have some sort of maybe benefit and some sort of other type of transaction. But if you're looking at the bubble of your business only, the sanity is going to be the money that you gonna be making um, in the business. And I know that's basic, but that's something to consider. And then obviously you have to have obviously your, your assets. Um, but they, you know, do I need the best assets in the world? Do I need the best laptops in the world? You know, do I need the best um, building in the world? Again, it might, it might translate to exactly that profitability, but if it does influence that, that's something to consider. Um, so the earnings gain is in your control, but obviously what is, what is earnings? That's always kind of a, kind of a differentiating thing. When you really kind of go past earnings, you really start to dig into two different things. Obviously your growth, you know, the size of my market, the potential of my market. Can I grow my market out? Am I just in a, uh, is my market just a block? Is it just an area? Is it just a, maybe a, a mile radius? Is it a five mile radius? Is it a 10 mile radius? I mean, am I, am I in, am I in, um, Kentucky or am I in, you know, California? I mean, what, how far am I going out? What's the potential of my market going to be? Obviously that's that top line revenue. Um, and then you obviously look at, you know, if it's not going to be that, well, when they're, where is it going to be? It's probably going to lie in your operations. Well, what does that mean, Zach? It's probably going to lie somewhere in between, um, you know, how, how much you're spending. I mean, how much do you have to essentially spend on wages, on your rent, on your, you, you know, your inventory, your miscellaneous expenses, whatever I have to spend to operate. And that's where I'm talking about, you know, having a hard line in operation. What is going to be those essential things? Um, obviously with COVID, that's, that's, that's a terminology that's been flying around is who's essential and who's not. So yes, when you deal with small businesses, we all understand that, okay, you know, I might have a staff of 10 and I know if it's just a hard line on it, can I get a staff of eight? And I'm not just talking about staff. I'm just saying, Hey, can I, can I do the same thing with eight? And obviously we've seen that a lot of the time it happened with COVID an example of, you know, wow, do I need a building? Do I need the space that we're spending on the space? Can we get the same things done or more things done? It's probably driven by technology, but definitely people are looking at different, especially with small businesses, looking at their operations differently. And what I mean by hard line is obviously having that hard line of saying, look, two of these guys are great employees, but honestly, you know, I probably can make, have this whole thing operating on eight employees and less space. Um, depending on how I figure my operations, you know, the majority of my customers are doing something else. Therefore, I don't need the space. And obviously you're improving value from that. Now that might be kind of a hard, hard line on it, but again, those are the considerations we're looking at from the earnings game. The other thing would be is obviously, and this is my, probably a little bit more research, it's probably a little bit more higher level. Um, when you're talking about your earnings game, well, what should my earnings be? You know, well, again, you know, well, what, what are my benchmarks? Well, what are those things? That essentially is your competitors, your comparables, the people that are doing the same thing, the same businesses that are you, that your competitors, you know, how much money are they making? Um, what are they using for staff? 
Um, what are they using for miscellaneous expenses? How much space do they have to, to achieve whatever they're trying to achieve in the same market you are? Um, how can they offer pricing that way where maybe I can't? Um, do they have special relationship with the vendors? Knowing your benchmarks, maybe doing a little bit of research, because essentially in the end with your valuation, that is going to be your comparables. You're gonna, you're, you're gonna be comparing your business to theirs to saying, okay, I own a restaurant. You know, Dave, he owns a restaurant. We've both been owning restaurants that have been doing similar things. If I know how Dave is operating, you know, and compare it to myself, I can maybe make adjustments. Who's making more earnings? Is Dave making more earnings or am I making that, those same amount of earnings? In theory, we should be making this about the same amount of earnings. If we're in the same market, in theory, we should be op, you know, pretty close to the same amount, but maybe we're not. If he's making more than I am, operating in the same kind of capacity in the same market, in theory, <laughs> he's doing a better job than I am. I'm not sure exactly how he's doing that, but again, these are the considerations when you know, okay, if he's performing that much better than I am, and that's my benchmark, and that's who I'm comparing myself to, then I need to kind of re-understand my, my understanding of how I can control my earnings. Now, I do understand that earnings has different definitions. I know it might not, but taxable earnings is different than um, maybe cash flow earnings or adjusted. I do understand that. But essentially what we're talking about is your, your, your market, your essential expenses, and how much you anticipate cash after tax that we get to walk away with that are not at risk as a business owner. I walk away with this much cash after I pay myself, after I pay all my essential expenses, that's what I'm gonna walk away with. That's what I'm expecting consistently over time into the future. And I know we kind of go into it, I'm kind of going rapid fire here, but hang with me. Probably the second biggest probably thing, you have your earnings game, you're very controllable. You're the decision maker. Let's say maybe you and a partner, um, most likely with small businesses, the majority of the time, you're gonna be the 100% owner of your business. The buck stops with you. You're the one that decides. You're the one that controls it. Um, so your decisions kind of fall into place. You can control it, or you control your expenses. You make the decisions. There's also something that you can kind of view your business as um, that's going to be at risk. Um, if, if I said to you as a business, look, you made $250,000 last year after all your expenses, will you make that next year? Okay. That, that little hesitation in your mind where you're saying, well, I don't know. Okay. That, whatever that is, I mean, that, that's considered risk. Okay. Well, why, why won't you make that next year? Well, these factors could happen. Okay, well, the probably most likely, I'm not 100% sure, but the probably most likely in your head, they're going to be something external. Well, the market was really, really good, you know, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know about COVID, but we, we don't know if really COVID's going away. Regardless of what you see as, as um, normal or not, and that, that kind of is flying around these days of what is normal operations. Regardless of what you see, everything else is probably going to be risk that you can't get to that $250,000 a year next year. Now you might get the $300,000 a year um, for next year. Well, we don't know, but whatever those hesitation moves are, you know, a couple big projects went my way. I don't know exactly. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen again just because I don't think we're gonna get those projects again. Again, you know, risk mitigation, risk is relative to what you're, what, what, what you're saying. Um, you might look at risk differently than I do, um, but again, the majority of buyers are going to try to consistently try to make or try to anticipate making that much money going into the future. And whatever those risk factors are, um, are something to be considered. Now, can you control those? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, if, if can I get to that number by increasing advertising? Maybe. Um, can I, can I, can I, um, you know, um, and maybe drive down my relationship with vendors. Maybe I have only one supplier. Maybe I only have one supplier that gives me all my inventory. And if he goes, if he goes bankrupt, that, that's a risky thing. And I know that he's not going to go bankrupt. I understand. But maybe, <laughs> maybe he could go. Maybe he's going to change pricing on me. You know what? Our lease is coming up here in the next year 
or so. And that's a risk factor because I don't really know what the new lease, the new landlord is going to be. I talked to, um, I talked to, um, we're working with a client right now that has a very similar situation, um, pretty much stating that, you know, we have a new landlord, the property manager sold the property. I think we're going to be okay, but I'm not 100% sure. So again, those risk factors are relative. Um, can he negotiate? Can that business owner negotiate? He definitely has it on the grid that is going to maybe substantially um, alter his operations. Um, but again, it, 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 it depends um, on how you see it. Um, at least he knows it's on the grid. And I don't know exactly all of the details of your business. Everybody knows, I mean, you know your business better than anybody. Um, and again, those are conversations to have to whatever your uh, trusted kind of circle group that you have um, to talk about. But it is a consideration, especially for obviously buyers. One of the main things obviously too, is understanding those customers. I know this is basic stuff, but customers have different thoughts. They have different ideas. They have different trends. Um, the more you know, the obviously the, the more you can mitigate those risks. Where are the customers going? What are your customers' tendencies? Who are your customers are? Many conversations that we have with business owners, especially usually the business owners that we have, we usually conduct kind of a key person interview involved. That seller that we're dealing with have most likely has been in that business for a significant portion of time. Um, that individual, most likely most sellers have a really, really good grasp on their customers. If they know their customers more, then they can obviously react. They can obviously adjust. Um, they can drive down certain risk factors if they know where the customers are going. They don't want to buy this anymore. You know, we used to sell a lot of this, but for some reason, they're not buying that anymore. So we pivoted, we adjusted, and now we're selling this. We're listening. We, they want this. And I know it seems basic. Well, yeah, I know my customers. Well, you'd be surprised how many business owners, okay, for some reason, my customers are not there like they used to be. Again, your relationship with customers um, is key. A lot of the time when we talk with business owners, how do we facilitate that information? How to have a system to facilitate that information? I'm not suggesting how to operate your business, but a lot of businesses are very, very strong about knowing their customers. If they have an idea of either having a survey, getting feedback, especially facilitating reviews, whatever it is these days, particularly with your business, I know. Well, it might be a marketing thing if I have a good, you know, four and a half stars. But again, really, it's knowing my customers. If I can getting their feedback somehow and then adjusting my operations, I can drive down those risk factors because obviously we're getting what they want. We're keeping customers happy. But I don't really know. Customers don't always tell me just blatantly what I can improve on. But having a system for that, again, um, we see a lot of business owners. Uh, driving down those risk factors. The other way, obviously, one of the main kind of ways that we see vendors. Um, again, what, what does that mean? I mean, I know a lot of small businesses are kind of service oriented these days. It seems like in the past probably 20 to 30 years, the whole economy has kind of gone away from you know, driven manufacturing to more of a service oriented type of economy. Um, so this might not be a huge thing um, in kind of the way uh, you operate, depending on what type of business you have. Um, but suppliers, vendors, if you're having some sort of substantial kind of advantage um, in the market with, with either your, if you have inventory or however you're trying to get your product out there, um, and that relationship with vendors is giving you a huge advantage. Obviously, knowing your vendors and their tendencies. Most of the time, small businesses, they deal with other small businesses. So I, I have a supplier. Um, they're relatively small and they provide me this particular product or, ser or product um, that I have. If that's the way, if that's the way it is and your main kind of steadfast vendor, two or three vendors is all I have. Um, a lot of conversations have that that might not be enough. Um, we obviously we worked with another client not too long ago 
that one of their main kind of steadfast vendors um, is a, w was having trouble providing supply um, to them, especially now with, with COVID. So what am I supposed to do with that? Well, okay, are we raising prices? Again, that's becoming more and more common just to raise prices. I can't get supply in, therefore I have to raise prices for you and we have to wait. Everybody has to wait for some reason. Um, again, that's risk. Um, or customers are very kind of likely, you understand this, to find other spots. You know, can they find other spots? I don't know. Um, but again, knowing those vendors, having relationships with those vendors, especially if you have key vendors. If you're saying, look, I only have one or two vendors, I would definitely suggest um, mitigating risk that way. Um, but what does that mean? Again, there's different ways you can do it. But, you know, the knee jerk reaction would be, hey, I'm just going to go find more vendors. Yes, you could. Um, another way we've seen is, yes, you know, a lot of small businesses try to diversify their product line of saying, okay, well, that's the only way that that's one of my main vendors I'm selling. Again, maybe I need to look at this a little bit differently and start selling something else. Um, or there's a complimentary service I can sell. Um, obviously, diversification in your product line or your service, you're mitigating risk. I can find different avenues to bring in. Maybe that's not what you're known for. Maybe that's not what you've based your entire business off of. Um, but again, the, those are the trends that we've seen certain businesses get into um, trying to obviously drive down these risk factors. But again, do you have complete control over, over them? No, because you just obviously like for risk is relative. So if you have a potential buyer that's coming in wanting to buy your business, they understand the value of your business. But again, if they see one particular vendor that that's all you have and that's really all I'm putting my stake on, um, it, it, it might very well throw up a red flag. You can see that it's relatively logical. Kind of the final thing that we're looking at also, uh, market tendencies. Yeah, these things, you know, they're not completely uncontrollable, but knowing them, understanding them, um, how is the market? How is it evolving? Um, and, you know, I have, I, you know, markets do evolve over time. Um, a lot of the time we talk to business owners that are usually sellers that we talk about their business, how it's evolved. We, one of the questions that we try to ask them is, you know, what, what, what are, what is the kind of historical timeline of this business? And you'll be very, very surprised. I mean, uh, how many businesses say, hey, look, the business that we started was absolutely different than what we're doing now. No, we, we might we might still have the same name. <laughs> you know, we might still. But again, we started here. And then again, these are probably 30, 40 year old businesses. You know, we started usually started selling it like this. Um, and we did this, this and this. But now over the years and years and years, now it's more like this. Um, and again, technology definitely probably has a lot to do with it. Um, again, customers, they're, they're change, change over time, um, kind of does that. Um, but those market tendencies, I mean, buyers are kind of the same, the same thing and obviously business owners. Your businesses obviously aren't gonna be the same. Most buyers over the time are not gonna be the same. Um, Definitely right now, there's certain there's certain industries that are that are, um, let's say, a little bit more, I guess, have a little bit more uh, frequency in transactions um, In business valuation. We can see kind of the number of transactions that are happening in certain businesses or certain industries. Obviously, the, the, the number of transactions that are happening in a certain businesses um, uh, might not be as many as other businesses. So over time, that evolves. Um, there's a lot, let's say restaurants, we can see a lot of data on restaurants and there's a lot of buy sell transactions happening, um, but maybe not as many on, let's say, um, small manufacturing parts, machine shops. Um, we can't see as many, they, they very well might be happening in the business valuation world, but we can't see those. Now, 10 years from well, that might be opposite. Um, obviously machine shops very well might be all the rage. Everybody wants to get into machine shops. Again, restaurants may, may not be the thing 20 years from now, but as of right now, we can see a lot of things happening. So over time, it's going to evolve. And those, the, that evolution, do you, can you control it as a business owner? Most likely not. Um, can you monitor it? Absolutely. 
Can you see it? Um, can obviously pull in advisors, obviously like Dave or whoever to say, hey, look, what, where is the market with this particular industry? Is it is it higher, lower? Is it is it where it's at all the time? And obviously that is a consideration when you're talking about your business value. Um, working with a client, we work with clients over years um, and obviously we did a valuation um, a few years back and obviously we're doing a valuation now. And obviously those those market tendencies, those risk factors, um, their earnings were about the same, but that doesn't mean necessarily mean the value is going to be the same. Um, the, the market could be looking at that particular industry or that particular business a little bit differently um, than it did, let's say, a few years ago. Obviously, COVID has kind of shed some light on certain things on how b businesses operate. Um, you know, you might be heavy with the people, you know, staying in your business, eating at your at your restaurant site. The entire drive through was non-existent. We had a drive through, but again, it was non-existent. Um, we didn't really do the, the DoorDash thing or we didn't really deliver at all. But now our delivery is is happening frequently um, and a lot larger and our operations changed. Um, again, those markets have changed. Um, businesses have changed and very well might be a little bit more attractive. But again, markets do evolve over time, um, just like risk factors. One of the main things too is, just like market tendencies, obviously evaluation is not, um, and, it, and this is kind of a main thing when you talk about market tendencies, it's really kind of like a balance sheet, depending on depending on how much you're in the numbers. If you own your own business, you might be into the numbers a little bit. You might not be. Um, you might give that to an accountant. But obviously, a balance sheet is at any moment in time. Um, if a, if anybody asks you, hey, how much cash do you have in the bank right now? Well, it depends. It depends on the time. You know, the amount of cash I have right now is this. Okay, but tomorrow it might be this. So evaluation is very similar. Um, obviously, it. We, usually, it's usually pretty good most of the time for about that 90 day period. When you're saying, hey, I get evaluation, it's going to be okay for 90 days unless something major happens in the market. You know, uh, you know, a hurricane can come through, wipe out my business, and next thing you know, it's not worth anything. Okay, yeah. But at a point in time, um, this is where it's at. Um, unless new financial information becomes available, unless new earnings have become available, unless your quarterly statements now are, are available. Buyers obviously want the information getting pulled in and they adjust um, in a point in time. Um, that valuation definitely, definitely want to, that's why we suggest probably um, about every year um, would be something that is to consider. Um, again, you know, do people do it more than once a year? Yeah, I mean, I have businesses that kind of do evaluation every six months. Even I have a, a businesses that are, are very interested in the valuation every quarter. Anytime we have new financial information, where are we at? Um, probably is not going to make a different change in a hum humongous amount, but definitely annually it would um, because every single year it's changing. Obviously, 2019 was a lot different than 2020 um, from a valuation standpoint. Um, so that is a consideration. Can you control it? I guess you could. If you're looking at a valuation and you're trying to exit your business and five years from now you want to exit from it, um, what would the valuation be of your business five years from now? It's hard to tell, um, but it most likely is going to be different than what it is right now. Um, market's going to be different. The tendencies are going to be different. Unless you drive down risk factors, mitigation five years from now, if it's going to be the exact same business that you have right now, okay, um, earning the exact same amount over years, okay, it could. Um, but most likely it's going to be different. Um, so biggest thing I know some business owners that we talk a lot of about is, well, my business was worth this much a year ago. Isn't it worth it that now? That, that Unfortunately, that's not the case. It could be worth more, could be worth less, um, depending on that moment in time. Another thing... Um, that you have is and somewhat you can control. Obviously you can control, obviously, where is your business located? Kind of, um, I, I can, I can, I can be in a certain spot. I've decided to, to, to have operations at this location. Um, but markets 
obviously are very area specific. Um, if you're trying to sell, um, obviously there's a lot more transactions, obviously in a place like, let's say California or Florida or Texas um, versus a place like, you know, where I'm located in Nebraska or Kentucky, um, there's not as many transactions happening. Um, does that lower down value? Not necessarily, um, but it is very area specific. Um, there might be a free flow of capital that's a little bit further. Um, there's definitely tendencies that we see the availability of capital from, um, I know definitely from lenders, um, but I know also from either private kind of venture, venture capitalists that want to be in certain markets. Therefore, it's driving up value um, since there are obviously more transactions happening. Um, I might have a business in Kentucky or I might have a business in um, South Dakota um, where obviously you can understand that I only could do so much um, for the number of buyers and sellers involved. Um, obviously, we always talk about location is everything. I understand that too, but very specific. If your market in your area has very specific, um, a very specific uh, description, let's call it a description of it has characteristics in this market, customers, certain types of vendors, delivery, how you operate, um, and those kind of driving factors kind of dictate value. Um, so you're saying, well, what's the business of a, oh, well, what's the value of a restaurant? Probably one of the name, one, one of the main things we would talk about is obviously where, where is it located? You know, probably the next thing would be, is it, you know, what type of, what type of restaurant is it? Um, are we, do we, do we sell chicken? Do we, is it a sit down joint? Is it a fast food joint? Is it a mainly, is it a, is it a drive through? Well, is, is in restaurants, restaurants? Again, yes and no, but there's different types of how they operate. Um, obviously we're seeing a lot through, we just did a valuation not too long ago on a coffee shop. And you would be very, very surprised. Coffee shops are coffee shops at the same time. Ones with drive throughs and one with aren't are, are drastically different in their valuations. Um, now that might be due to earnings, that might be due to customers, because obviously customers, it's hard, I guess, let's say we assuming that it's hard for them to get out of their car and go get a cup of coffee inside versus I just want to stay in the car and go through. Um, obviously, it's tougher for coffee shops with non drive throughs to sell coffee on rainy days than it is um, than drive throughs. We don't see that tendency is going up and down. Um, there's some seasonality going on with coffee shops uh, with with non drive throughs I mean, see, they, they tend to be a little bit slower. I know it's a little bit weird, but they tend to be a little bit slower um, in the wintertime because obviously that walk through traffic. Um, so it is area specific, um, you know, but most likely how you operate defines that area. Knowing your customers kind of define that area. Um, so coffee shops are not all treated the same. Um, I would imagine if you did have a coffee shop or if you're operating a coffee shop, it's something to obviously talk about to consider where am I located at? How is the market currently in my local market? If I tried to sell my coffee shop to a private seller or excuse me, to a private buyer. Um, those are definitely considerations. Um, again, I know certain things, certain pillars, this might be a lot to kind of consider, um, but we will walk through the things that we consider for business valuation. The earnings game is huge. Um, I would definitely probably suggest you would take a look at your earnings from a standpoint of what what can I control? How can I improve it? Is it consistent over time? Um, do I have the same amount of earnings in 2018, 2019, 2020? Um, obviously, that volatility is something to consider also. Um, and we can take that off the grid here. Obviously, risk mitigation. You know, how can I drive down these risk factors? I make $250,000 a year. Am I going to make it going forward? No, you're not. Well, why wouldn't I make 250000 going forward? I've always made it every single year coming up to this point. Can I make $250,000 going a year? Whatever those factors are that are putting that two hundred fifty grand at risk, obviously there's things to think about, things to talk about, how to drive those factors down. Um, and obviously those market tendencies. What is the market? How do you tap into that market with understanding of um, where's the market right now locally? Where is kind of the evolution of where I'm going with this business in this industry? Um, is it is it considered a mature industry? Is it considered kind of a dying industry? Is it is it something that is growing? 
Um, do I have more people getting into it? Do I have more competitors that I have to compete against um, consistently over time? Um, and then obviously, how's my area? What is specifically, what is my block? Whatever my industry is, is it an attractive looking area? Um, is it a growing area? Um, are people moving there more? Um, are they moving there less? Um, are people leaving the state, leaving the block, leaving the neighborhood, or are they coming more? Um, so again, those are all kind of factors that we kind of, it's tough for business owners to do this, um, at least what we find, because obviously you're operating your business. Um, but again, if you're talking about business valuation, um, kind of those are kind of the main kind of steadfast things that we see um, to consider. That's all I have. Um, obviously there's my contact information. Um, you know, if you want to visit um, our website too, definitely. Um, go in there. We do other things. If you're looking at an evaluation or if you're looking at an industry, um, you can contact me directly. We can talk off the grid further um, about any questions that you had to. Thank you, Zach. That was awesome. You know, and that's, um, you know, um, uh, this is something I've really okay. been thinking about a lot. And I'm glad you touched on the, uh, the risk mitigation, you know, because that's something that um, when you're operating your business, you don't really think about it. And you're kind of thinking about the first part of business, you know, your business, like driving, driving revenue, but, you know, <clears throat> mitigating risk is nothing more than good business practices, you know, and allows you to manage your business more effectively by mitigating these, these risks. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess uh, the, the other part that really struck me too, is the, um, you know, when you're operating a business just for your income, you're, you're leaving a lot of this value on the table because you're not thinking about the next piece of your business, which is, you know, let's say one day you want to exit and you've got really no value. Yeah, you had a great living, but you didn't think of the value and you didn't have, you don't have really a, maybe not even have a sellable business there at the end of the day. Absolutely. We, um, we talk to business owners a lot about that uh, saying, well, you know, I've, I've kind of followed the advice of whatever, whoever individual I trusted, but again, if you kind of start with the main kind of concept of, look, I started a business, business to make money. And if, if I'm not making money, then obviously you, you understand kind of an outsider looking in, you can tell them, Hey, look, I made I really do make money, but on paper, I don't. Okay. So, you know, the, it, it gets weird kind of strange conversations that happen too. Well, you know, what, what are we, what are we supposed to look at here then? I mean, what is, what is your business then? Because hopefully it makes money going forward. Um, and obviously we talked about this last time a little bit too, is, I mean, essentially we're talking about a machine. I mean, we're trying to generate a machine and the, that whatever, that the exhaust of that is going to be money eventually. Now, how much money that depends on you. Um, but that is the concept. Um, and if we're getting away from that concept, that's fine. You, you, it's your prerogative. You can do whatever you want with your business, but if we're getting away from that concept, obviously buyers are going to be confused. <laughs> They're gonna, that doesn't make sense to me. Why would someone start a business to lose money? Um, not, not forever, maybe for a couple years, three years, four years. You've been in business for 10 years and you never made money. That doesn't make any sense. You know, so again, um, that those are conversations to have and consider. Right. Yeah, I, I think when I think of evaluations, I think about the example of uh, if I was to go buy, if I sell a car I liked online and it, it's 20,000 bucks and it says great shape and I go there then I see the tires are, are bald. Well, then I can make that mental calculation. Now I discount the price because there's a risk of the, that tire failure and I have an expense. And it's the same with your business. If you don't mitigate these risks going forward, you devalue that business. Exactly. Now, I mean, that's a consideration that, I mean, every business owner has. Should I replace the tires on it? Um, will I get a return on it? I don't know. I mean, it might be just, it might be just a ticket to get in the ball game that it needs to have tires that work good, you know? And if that's something for me to even sell it for, okay, these are basics. Again, you know, you're considering other cars, you're considering other businesses, you're looking at it different ways, but obviously, yes, you're trying to make that business. Um, and it, it's just good business practice just in general, because when you have a conversation with that buyer, you're going to, you're going to have an honest thing, honest conversation with them about, you know, here are the things that you probably should consider risky that I always thought as risky as a business. And I tried to kind of adjust the business, but again, you can't, you can't mitigate risk to zero. No one can. I mean, that's just not the nature of business, you know, yeah. um, but you try to do the best that you can. 
So Lisa has a question. So if you have any questions out there, go ahead and put those in the chat for us. But Lisa asks, how does a lender know how many vendors you use? Do you suggest opening accounts or credit cards with different vendors? Okay. You know, every, every lender is a little bit different in uh, how they operate. But um, again, you know, through the course of conversations, most lenders, most of the time, will have kind of a standard kind of conversation or template they're going to ask. How do they know? You know, there is some trustworthiness going on of how honest you are with the conversation, but they do understand that some, um, some, some care about how a business operates. Some, some don't, they don't really mind. They just see the cash flow. They see it. Okay. Um, but the ones, I mean, lenders, you have to kind of take it from their point of view. Lenders are all about, risk mitigation. Okay. So they're all, that's all that, that's what they live in risk. So I would think most lenders would be interested in that, but again, some lenders, some business relationship managers, they just want to kind of close the deal and move on. Um, do they know, you know, I would think, I would say they should, um, but not always. Um, they won't ask. Um, they just assume that the business owner knows how to, how to, how to work how to work their business. Um, but if you had kind of, let's say an honest, um, I don't know what you want to call it, consultant, maybe someone like Dave, maybe someone else, you know, this is something that at least you can think about. Now, what should you do? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the scene, but you have one vendor. I would think that's a problem. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out. Right. You probably need to, if that vendor is important, some people I talk with all the time, they know. Dude, I have one vendor. I know there's 40 out there. I just got to pick up the phone and call them. Okay, cool. That's different. As long as you know that the vendor that you can pick up with, I buy chicken from this place. I can buy chicken from these four different places. They would love my business. They call me every single month trying to get my business to sell me chicken. That's fine too, as long as we had that there. So it is a conversation. Yeah, uh, uh, John Warlow, I don't know if you're aware of him, but he calls it the, the Switzerland structure. You want to be neutral with everybody so you don't, you know, if, uh, yeah. if one customer leaves you, it's no big deal because you have plenty of other ones. And if, if your key employee leaves, no big deal. You have another good ones, you know, that are there to take his place. So those are all risks that, you know, you don't, you don't want to be too dependent on any one, one thing, you know, throughout your your business. That's a, I mean, the internet does help with that kind of depending on how your business is structured. One of the main things we talk about too, a lot of the time is risky is, you know, do you live in a college town? You know, are your customers college people? You know, I mean, you have these humongous employers, certain cities that have huge, huge employers, Washington, DC. I mean, obviously you can see that as a risk factor, but my main customer is the university, whatever your local university it is, you know, I'm in Ames, Iowa, or I'm in, you know, College Station, Texas. I mean, those are college towns. When they shut down or when they leave, that's it. I'm shut down. You know, I'm going to go quiet. So, I mean, is that good? Is that bad? Yes, it's nice to have those main, and it's consistent, you know, but not always like that. You know, hospitals, we see that as a lot of the time too. I opened up a Jimmy John's franchise or whatever it is right next to a hospital. And that's where majority of, you know, that, hey, you know, is it risky? Yeah, you can see it as risky. Okay. All you got is nurses and doctors coming in here on their lunch break. You know, I mean, that's all you got. And at night for the lunch. Okay, so that, you know, you could see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll get to them. But um, when you when you, you were talking about um, assessing the market, when you're doing evaluation and you're looking for market tendencies, how, how do you do that? What, where, where do you go to first? So usually you have these trend levels of you're trying to um, over time see where the market's at. Um, you know, market tendencies usually have a lot to do with, um, you know, timelines. Um, we, we try to take a sample of, let's say, um, transactions that are happening within the past two years. Then we pull it out to see what's happening in the last five years. And then we try to see what's happening in the last 10 years. Um, so when you see these transactions either getting smaller or getting bigger, obviously you can make an assumption that something's happening in the market. Um, these certain industries are, are very, very um, popular right now. Um, people are interested in these certain types of industries because we can see the transactions happening. 
um, for some reason, uh, more than what they used to even five, 10 years ago. Um, now what that is, I mean, anybody can have a theory on what it might be. Um, but again, you, you try to make an assessment on it. Um, we see a lot of activity with a lot of software activities, with a lot of service oriented activities right now um, that we see. Um, CPAs, it seems like accounting firms, we see a little bit of an uptick lately. Um, and then that might be some exiting things going on where people are trying to exit their, their sole proprietorship or their, their, their small business. Um, I started a firm maybe years ago. Now I'm trying to get out of it. Um, we, we see so a little bit of a lot of activity in healthcare, a lot of activity with dental, um, practices. Um, we see a little bit of uptick going on right now. Um, a lot of the theory is out there too that, that, transactions, lenders are becoming more and more active in the space also. Um, they see it as a little bit more of a opportunity to make, um, um, they're, they're utilizing the services of the, of the SBA a little bit more than what they used to. Um, a lot of lenders are getting more comfortable with this type of transaction. Um, essentially what you're saying is you're talking about asset kind of lending and then you're talking about cash flow of lending. Obviously, SBA is a lot of cash flow of lending. Um, what that means is, is the business making money? Does it have a cash? Um, is it a viable business? They're trying to drive down assets. Lenders have traditionally been about assets, real estate, equipment, whatever I can kind of repossess um, if the loan goes bad. So either way is okay, um, but it seems like more and more are getting more comfortable with cash flow of lending. Um, and that's essentially what transactions are happening. So if we drive up the more number of lenders that are comfortable with that transaction, that seems like to be a little bit more of an uptick with the service oriented type of businesses um, that are essentially cash flow based. Mm -hmm. And then obviously that, that does it blow up the market? It doesn't really blow up the market, but it does over time swell the market. Um, so that's a theory out there also of saying, you know, the, maybe five years ago, that, that activity would be there because the interest is there, but just the availability of capital wasn't there. But now the capital is there, the availability is there, um, and the market is more active. We can see more transactions. So the, the information is getting more accurate too. Um, obviously, the number of transactions that you have, the better. Then you can see where the market's at, how they view risk, um, where the buyers review, uh, obviously review uh, or view risk. Um, to certain industries. So that's nice too. Is it still there? Like, is it there to the point, let's say where like housing sales are or residential housing, commercial, commercial real estate? Probably not because those, those transactions are happening like millions a day. Um, again, well, this is probably on a smaller scale, depending on the type of business. So the, the databases are getting more robust. They're getting bigger. Um, but probably not like to that level. Not yet anyway. So when, when you do a, a, a first time valuation, I, I guess it's it's a bigger job the first time, you know, to get a, you know, get the the, uh, the background and to understand the business and how it all works. But if you were to do this on a regular basis, like if you're going to do an, a, an annual valuation, you know, your your next year valuation would be much easier, wouldn't it? Like, oh, because we did one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's it's more of a plug and play type of thing, unless the business has changed something. Like, you know, we, hey, we used to be this, but you know, this next year we, we started doing this. And every now and then you get these businesses, uh, small businesses that kind of do multiple things. You know, we're 70% this, but we're 30% this. And if, it, if the market changes where we're now, now we're 50-50. Are you now, now we are, you know, now we do more of that than we did of this. So, you know, um, the classification code that we use obviously is the, the NAICS code, which is the North American industrial classification system. If that changes, and obviously the name can change or whatever, but if that changes in the estimation of whoever's valuing it, um, then you're kind of, then you're kind of pulled into a different pool of transactions. I used to be considered a restaurant, but now all we are is really just a catering type of business. Okay. Those are two different types of, of transactions that are happening. So if that doesn't happen where it's just, I, I, you know, I've been doing the same thing year after year after year after year. Yeah, it's it's relatively easy. You have different financial information though too, mm -hmm. and then you you'd be surprised on you know year to year how much how much everything changes. Um, yeah. You know, 
the staffing levels. I saw a uh, statistic that said that um, I think it was eighty percent of the small businesses that are put on the market just don't sell. Have you have you seen something like, along, along those lines? You know, I haven't seen that statistic. Um, I know for uh, it depends on what you mean by market. <laughs> so I mean, just I um, want to sell my business. I guess that's a market. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how do you sell a business is is different. That's a little bit more. I would say probably kind of in the beginning stages, adolescent stages also. You have individuals dealing with business brokers, okay? And that's a very, very highly specialized type of thing. Um, it's a little, business brokers are a little bit more fragmented though. They're kind of doing their own thing. They're trying to market your business. They're trying to figure out how to find buyers um, for your particular business because they're trying to create buyers. Um, it's, it's getting more and more active. Obviously the, the industry, it seems like getting a little bit more organized um, as far as using technology, biz by sell, which is uh, bizbysell.com. Obviously, if you kind of ever heard of that before, that that's becoming more active. So biz by sell um, is essentially used by business brokers. It's a website and they sell businesses around the nation. Um, so again, generates buyers, generates interest. Um, and then you can obviously you can list your own business on there if you want to. Um, but again, a lot of business brokers, again, I could see that where you're saying, hey, look, I wake up one day and I'm gonna sell my business and it's for sale. Um, a lot of business owners don't know exactly how to do it. Um, they'll try to contact a business broker, um, but depending on the interest, depending on the business broker, there's really not a universal kind of method that I have seen other than biz by sell a little bit of, of how to go about it. Um, and then obviously you have the discretionary also, too, it's not like you put a sign in front of your on, on the corner and says, hey, this business is for sale. That's tough because customers get skittish, employees get skittish, you know, so um, has to have a certain amount of discretion involved. So it's a challenge that way also, too. Um, but again, yes, a lot of business owners, if you talk to them, a lot of them probably say everything's for sale for the right price. You know? <laughs> right. Uh -huh. right. How how do you do it? I don't know. You know how do I how do I find that buyer? Um, you know, a lot of the time we see the first step would probably be internal employees. If you have some sort of internal kind of relationship with an employee that kind of knows the business and they want to take over, um, that's very common. Um, another way would be obviously yeah, partnerships are very very common also, and then competitors. Um, a lot of the time people sell to competitors to try to take over a different additional market. Um, but again, do we know those transactions are happening? We know they're happening, but we just, we, the details of it always a little bit more off the grid right? when it comes to the amount of information. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have. We're at the top of the hour. So Zach, man, I really appreciate you coming back today. And um, I really enjoyed the conversation on, uh, on risk mitigation. This has been, this has been really good. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And if anybody has any questions, uh, want to talk off, that's fine too. You can contact me, contact Dave. And yeah. thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate it. Yep. Zach is a, uh, is an awesome uh, resource. So please reach out to me if you have any questions because, you know, we start businesses to make money, but yes, we also want to build a valuable business and there's ways to do that. Uh, so Zach's a good resource. So appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Zach. And uh, we'll see you soon. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next week. Bye guys.